happy, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Enjoy your time. What are you afraid of? You know, that Connecticut shooting. You know, you, you send your kids to school when you're, you know, I know you, some of you have young kids and you will and then do everything right and then things don't go right. And that's going to happen to you in your surgery and your careers as well. You'll use good judgment, things will go well, and then things won't be well. And it'll be a statistic and not having anything to do with what you don't do. It won't be a mistake of omission, it'll just be a statistic. And how you try to prevent those types of things and minimize risk is really what it's all about being a good physician, especially a surgeon. You might be the most facile person in the, in the world, but if you're a chucklehead and you don't use good judgment, then you're a bad surgeon. And so sometimes the best athletes or the best uh, facility people end up having poor judgment because they feel they can never get into trouble. Infection is a little bit different because anytime you make an incision in the human body, no matter where it is, infection is always a possibility no, much, no matter how much uh, time you take in trying to prevent that. So uh, endophthalmitis is an inflammatory reaction. It doesn't have to be infectious, but for our purposes, it is, and that's what 99.9% .9 .9 of folks, when they talk about endophthalmitis, mean. You get lidedema, injection, chemosis, discharge, hypopian, fibrin in the anterior chamber, all the things that you've seen in the emergency room and in the clinic. Posteriorly, the bad stuff, the vitritis, the paraphlebitis, the retinal ischemia, the retinal hemorrhages, portend a more serious prognosis of an already serious condition. You can classify enophthalmitis in one of two ways, onset or precipitating cause. So the onset can be an acute or chronic and even subacute, and the precipitating cause can be endogenous, like a diabetic who has polynephritis or a UTI, or it could be a masquerade syndrome, as in this tumor that's metastatic to the pupillary margin, and then you have a tumor hypopian. And the most common, of course, is exogenous, is the thing that we see most commonly here. Exogenous can be post-traumatic. You certainly see a lot of trauma in the emergency room, okay? Metallic trucker farm bodies versus uh, uh, vegetable, you know, um, organic material. And then post-operative. And then the timing is either acute, chronic, and then subacute is kind of a variable uh, designation. In 1998, Bascom Palmer looked at a decade of their endophthalmitides depending on types of surgery that were done. So cataract pars plana, PKs, you know, desects weren't being done at that time, glaucoma filtering procedures, and this was actually in the pre-mitomycin F5-FU age, secondary IOLs. And if you look at the bottom, carorefractive, uh, 262 cases. And that's totally different now. Anti-VEGF injections, our, our surgical procedure last year, our practice did over 32,000 injections, intravitreal injections. So all these different things are happening now that just didn't exist back then. But if you look at the incidence of endophthalmitis back in uh, that decade, it was, it was less than one in a thousand. And then a strange thing started happening. Jonathan Javid, who was a resident with me, he looked at uh, Medicare results, and his results from about 1994 were about the same, about 0.08% less than one in a thousand. And then just five years later, that incidence almost doubled. And then in 2005, and then 2006 with the European study, that incidence doubled again. And so you would think that as your technology improved and your techniques improved, that your incidence of complications would go down. But something happened in that error, and that error was you went from stitched procedures tunnel procedures, superior incisional procedures in cataract surgery to what? Temporal incisions. And so there's always a learning curve and there's always increased exposure and that's when everything started to change in terms of endophthalmitis. And so these days you actually see more endophthalmitis as a general rule because of the types of surgeries that we do. That's starting to come back down again, but in glaucoma filtering procedures, again, mitomycin 5-FU, Back in 1994, when this data was published out of Bascom Palmer, three, three out of almost 2,000 cases. Now you get these very avascular filtering blebs, 
you get a lot of positive Cydels, and you get secondary blebitis infections and endophthalmitis. And these are very nasty types of infections that are often delayed. And Rich Parrish, who was a stellar resident here, was the chief of Bascom Palmer and uh, written extensively, looked at the data at Bascom Palmer and the incidence of infection that's delayed in their mitomycin 5-FU cases. And it's almost, it's like about 2% or even a little bit in some other studies per year cumulatively. Two out of 100. That's huge numbers. I have to shoot myself. There's other procedures that are done too, and they can also invoke endophthalmitis, and, and again, just laser sutures. Lasering of sutures, you can get micro defects in the epithelium, pulling out sutures. You never take those things for granted. They're always a risk for infection, and should always consider antibiotic use after that. But it's just the things that we do just keep going up. The types of things and procedures and the numbers keep going up. More procedures in terms of types of procedures and more numbers, increased risk. Keratofractive procedures, I mean, how many, I mean, you know, some people do 200 in a week, I think, Lasix in a week. Um, and this is the old days of RK, but RK with micro incisions or secondary corneal ulcerations uh, right here led to secondary infections, and that was rare. Now we put false keratoprosthesis in the eye full term, and these folks are on long-term antibiotics. But the infection risk goes up because they have something false that's covering the surface of their eye. And then in LASIK procedure, um, less so with PRK, but in LASIK procedure, you get more unusual types of infections, including mycobacterium. It's rare, but it happens. And when you have an eye that I operate on that has a retinal attachment, they're counting fingers as opposed to somebody who's 20 years old and has 20-20 vision corrected and you're doing a LASIK procedure, that's substantial. That's substantial difference in thinking and the way that person's thinking, uh, including the way people expect their outcomes to be these days. Pars plantar vitrectomy, actually, in incisional surgery is one of the lowest infection risks, far lower than cataract surgery. And in 1995, that was 0.04%, half of what cataract surgery was, about one in 2,000, a little over 2,000 cases. <coughs> and then something happened here, and you can see the, 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 um, the incidence quadrupled, or over that, went up fivefold. And this is our data, and this was the beginning of the small incisional error in vitrectomy with trocar. So we went from 20-gauge incisions that were sutured at the end of the case to 23 and 25 gauge incisions that were not sutured. And as a result, we definitely saw an uptick in endophthalmitis. And you would think, logically, that smaller incision, less risk. But if you have a leaky incision, then you have increased risk. In addition, we do a lot of injections. Okay, last year, again, as we mentioned, 32,000 injections plus in mid-Atlantic retina at all our offices. And so even if your infection risk is one in 4,000, one in 5,000, which is exceptionally small, you see a half a dozen infections, and you remember them. So in general, the rates of post end endophthalmitis have increased, not decreased, in the modern era, and that's because the number and variety of surgical procedures has increased. And the variability in onset and the presenting signs in infecting organisms has also, as a result, increased. You know, post cataract surgery is usually the first five days, weak tops unless it's a chronic or indolent type of endophthalmitis. But now you have all kinds of other things like glaucoma and filtering procedures that can show up several weeks, several years after the fact. So you always have to be on point. And more variables require a tailored uh, approach and a little bit of attention to what your patients are telling you, especially when they're calling you up at odd hours. So what is optimal management? Optimal management is always about prevention first, then early recognition, and then treatment. So. Uh, preoperative prevention, you have to recognize risk factors preoperatively, and then the uh, thoughts that regarding antibiotics and povidone preoperative that most of us use, there's a lot of different literature on that. But if somebody has a lot of blepharitis or scruff, you know, if they have canaliculitis, um, if they look like, this is Tim Johnson after coming from a hard night out. Uh, <laughs> if they have thyroid disease and they have exophthalmus and they're injected and they have a dry surface and they have exposure, all these things you have to take into account because these are people who have increased risk. And as elective surgical procedures uh, with cataract surgery, you always have time and you always want to be safe. In terms of the use of uh, 
uh, antibiotics, Zymaxid now, and Vigamox, moxifloxacin, and then povidone. Of these three, which is the most effective as a preventative preoperatively? Povidone. Povidone. And which is the cheapest? Povidone. Povidone. And what can be given right before surgery? <laughs> Povidone. Povidone, povidone, povidone. No doubt about it. And the problem with antibiotics is not that they can't be effective, but they have holes in them because they don't cover everything. And there's always increased resistance. Povidone uniquely is cheap. It's the golden bullet. You know, it's a silver bullet. It's cheap. It's there. And you use it, and it, and it is very, very effective. So there have been nice studies in, with fourth-generation quinolones looking at how these agents penetrate. And the great thing about fourth-generation quinolones is that they can penetrate intact corneal surfaces. And uh, 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 Sinu Hara Prasad is a great guy, along with Bill Mueller out in Chicago, did this study several years ago where they gave preoperative drops to folks before cataract surgery, and then when they were in cataract surgery, they took samples from the anterior chamber and they analyzed them for MIC levels. And they did uh, three different formats. They gave them every two hours for three, uh, three days. They gave them QID doses for three days, and then they put a collagen shield on folks. And what they found was that the aqueous concentration, if you gave it to them every two hours prior to the three days prior to surgery, was well above MIC levels for most commonly encountered postoperative pathogens. And that's just with topical use. So it gets great penetration. And at that frequency of injections, even the vitreous samples approached uh, or just barely exceeded a lot of MIC levels for uh, frequent pathogens. So this is just with topical medication. So you definitely see a benefit for preoperative use. However, if you just use them four times a day, you still had adequate drug level in the anterior chamber, but in the vitreous, there was less penetration. So you can make a good case for using preoperative quinolones for preoperative prophylaxis. Operative, a lot of it is what we were talking about with clear corneal incisions. Do you do a limbal-based incision? Do you do it temporally? Some people still do superior incisions, and we'll sit at the head of the table, I have people with me. When I was training, he'll still do that. You know, they'll do stitchless procedures, but they'll do it above. How, um, um, how, how clean is your incision? Is it two-plane? Is it three-plane? Do you put a suture in it if there's any uh, thought of leakage? All these different things come into surgical technique, but also surgical judgment. So in general, you want it two millimeters in, and you want it even. You don't want anything extending on the inside wound structure towards the limbus, because that gives you increased leakage. Three-plane, I think, is effective over two-plane. And if there's any doubt, what do you do? You put a suture in there, all right? Because sutured incisions don't leak. Other things involve antibiotics and the infusate. And there are certain people who will, like Gills is known for this, putting uh, vancomycin in the infusate. Well, that's great. But if you look at the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study, even with that, there were 10 patients who got endophthalmitis who were involved in the study who had intravitreal, I mean, intracameral antibiotics that were in the infusate at the time of surgery. So it is not a silver bullet. The other thing about vancomycin increases your incidence of postoperative cystoid macular edema. So there's always benefits and negatives. In the SCRS study, they, it was a prospective randomized partially mass study about uh, with endophthalmitis prophylaxis, and it compared perioperative levofloxacin, like a third-generation quinolone, to intracameral cephalosporin. And what they showed was that the endophthalmitis incidence uh, uh, in the levofloxacin group was almost five times that if you used intracameral cephalosporin. Okay, and that looks very impressive. The p-value is out of sight. But you always have to read these papers critically. And there were some problems with that study. And the one problem was there was a really high incidence of endophthalmitis in the minimal treatment arm because they delayed topical use of antibiotics in that group by 24 hours. So most pathogens gain access to the eye through your wound sites within the first 24 hours, actually probably in the first three to four hours. So that's a 0.3% incidence of endophthalmitis. That's huge. So that's definitely different even in the modern era com uh, comparatively. And then they used a third generation topical quinolone, which does not have the effectiveness of the fourth generation or the penetration. And they used cephalosporin, which as their, uh, as their intracameral antibiotic of choice, which was cheap, but does not have the kill ratio compared to uh, 
other medicines that are available and a little bit more expensive. So you can see the effectiveness of the third generation, second generation, fourth generation quinolones in this graphical analysis for coagulase negative staph and regular staph. And you can see that GADI and MOXI really, really effective, whereas Levo is kind of in the middle and then Cipro is, you know, the other side. So in terms of effectiveness, they kind of used a middle in antibiotic and they delayed it. Here are the kill curves. If you look at the cephalosporin, the cefiroxamine, and the red line, you can see it kills, but then it's very, very flat. Vanco gives you a very rapid kill, and then it goes away. It dissipates very, very quickly. So in terms of using antibiotics, they, they didn't quite, they went the cheap route. They didn't quite give the good route, and their end off incidence incidence was very, very high because they delayed treatment post-operative treatment in terms of topical agents. So there's a little bit of doubt about that study as well, though people quote her all the time. Post-operatively, topical antibiotics. Um, Bacitration is difficult to get now, but can anybody tell me what's the number one cytal ointment that's available? Cytal ointment, not static ointment, antibiotic out there that you can use, very common. It's bacitracin, it's right there on the slide, okay? Bacitracin is old, it's been around forever, and it kills. It doesn't, it's not static, it kills, and it kills all gram positives. MRSA, MRSI, um, everything, pretty much, okay? Whereas quinolones are a little bit more sexy and things of that nature, but as you'll see in a little bit, their ability to kill MRSA and MRSI is very, very poor and becoming an increasing problem. So you want cytal agents. Why? Because they kill. The great thing I like about ointments, especially afterwards, they're viscous. So in vitrectomy surgery, they kind of plug things a little bit, or at least that way, I, that's the way I think about things. So in the initial aspect of uh, the initial post-operative period, I like something that kills, and I like something that might give you a little protective barrier if you have a little bit of leak. And that's cheap. One negative of bass trace, and it's a little bit irritating to the cornea. Um, so we talked about prevention. Early recognition, and that's about patient education and about you listening and then having a good differential diagnosis. So when you have an endophthalmitis, what's the usual timing? You do surgery at noontime on a Thursday. So when's endophthalmitis, if it's going to appear, what's most likely, what's the time period? If somebody calls you up six hours or 12 hours after the fact and has discomfort, is that likely to be endophthalmitis? Probably not. It could be, but it's very unlikely. How about 24 hours? Yeah, you're starting to get into that range, out to about five days, you know, for acute endophthalmitis. That's the, that's the power alley for endophthalmitis. Um, but this person shows up. They had surgery uh, about noontime, and they show up the next day at 8 o'clock in the morning to the doctor's office, and they look like this, okay? There's a little teeny hypopian. Here's another case, same thing. Segmental swelling, okay? What's this person's iris doing? That's often key. That, that, that's a good diagnostic way sometimes of determining when you're nervous about post-operative inflammation that doesn't quite sniff like endophthalmitis. Toxic anterior segment syndrome, they usually have mid-dilated fixed pupils. They don't react really well. And they can be very segmental, like the slide on the right, or they can be diffuse, okay? Um, they kind of have little hypopians, and they can look inflamed. But the patients are usually fairly comfortable. And so this is an increasing problem, especially in ASCs where the pressure is on to use reusable instruments. And the question of why these occur has anything to do from uh, endotoxins related to pathogens to not, you know, changing the water and sterile baths and things of that nature and things kind of hanging out. So it's not direct infection, but a lot of people think it's either related to detergents that get stuck in, in, um, in the cylinders of reusable instruments and or toxins from uh, uh, mi microbes that are dead but are still hanging around. How about this patient? 24 hours after surgery, kind of these things on the endothelium, and then this is the posterior segment. Eye is comfortable, all right? Vision's not real great. And this is when they're lying down. So they're sitting up and then lying down. And so this is retained lens material. So open capsule, you always get the call, you know, I think I got everything. And then 
what happens is there's some cortex that gets hung up below the lens behind the iris. The iris goes, the pupil goes down a little bit during the procedure. And then the next day, they have this big fluffy cortex. And then as soon as the cortex hits the vitreous cavity or the aqueous, it absorbs water like a sponge and it just fluffs up. And then they have this. And they can get an inflammatory reaction on the slide on the left. It's just lens material that's dependent on the endothelium because of the body position of the patient. Here's something that can give you an, an endophthalmitis looking picture several weeks to months after the fact that looks just like P. acnes or indolent endophthalmitis. And that little chip of nucleus, because of phaco emulsification, all right, that'll be in the angle and you can't see that. And at the slit lamp, examina at lamp examination, this patient had a zonal inflam inflammatory reaction several months after their surgery. Posterior segment was clean. They didn't look infected, but there was suspected P. acnes endophthalmitis. And we put the gonio prison on, and this little chip of nuclear material, not radioactive, nuclear material, was in the inferior angle. And so you save this person to tap and inject or explantation of the lens, and all that little chip came out, and the patient was fine. I guarantee in your career you'll see something like this. So always put a gonio lens on. That's just you know, a busy day. Just, just do it. It'll save you. We've seen it several times over the years. So, and then, and then treatment. So prevention, recognition, and then treatment. Um, years ago, uh, when I was a young attending, the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study was being done because back then the big debate was whether or not to tap and inject do vitrectomy or admit people. We admitted a lot of people and gave them intravenous uh, uh, antibiotics. So the question is, did any of these things benefit the patients? And so the case for vitrectomy was the reduction of microbial load, secondary toxins, reduction of inflammatory materials and vitreous opacifications. And so not only the bacteria, but also the toxins that they elaborate that just eat up the retina. And so right here, you can just see bare RP, and right above it, there's just the retina was just destroyed. Okay, and some of the easiest microbes to kill, like strep, are the deadliest. So you can kill it, but it'll just have a tremendous toxic reaction because of all the endotoxins. So part of the thought process between, behind early vitrectomy is to eliminate a lot of those. Also, you can get better collection of samples, argument for better distribution of antibiotics in the vitrectomized eye, and quotes and quotes reduction of RD risk. Oh, those things may be debatable. The disadvantages are, is that it delays you uh, because you have to often wait for the, an operating room. Use of an OR and the equipment involved isn't always accessible to people who are out in peripheral offices, especially the cataract surgeons. And then there's always surgical risk, and most of that is borne by poor visualization. And when you have a vitrectomized eye, your antibiotics that you inject inside the eye, they clear more rapidly, so they hang out uh, less time. In the EVS, there were some limitations. They had to be clipped, they had to have, have, they had to have had cataract surgery in the last six weeks or a secondary IOL placement. So right away, you eliminate a lot of other potential surgeries. They had to have hypopian or clouding of the aqueous or vitreous obscuring second order arterials. And they had to have corneal clarity suitable for vitrectomy and a corneal and anterior chamber clarity allow, allowing uh, iris visualization. So all of a sudden, you eliminate a lot of people who are more severely involved. And then the visual acuity had to be better than light perception, but worse than 20 over 50. And they did this format where they either did vitrectomy or tap and inject, and they crossed over and they either got intravitreal antibiotics, I'm sorry, intravenous antibiotics, and were hospitalized or sent home. <clears throat> Vancomycin and amicacin were used. Now we use cephalosporin, typically instead of amicacin because of risk of aminoglycoside toxicity. And the choice of getting steroids or not was left up to the discretion of the surgeon. Otherwise, the topical antibiotics, the subconjunctival antibiotics, the intravenous antibiotics were pretty standard. And the endpoints were visual acuity and media clear, clearing. And so uh, the interesting thing, it hasn't changed that much in terms of pathogens. Coagulase negative staphylococcus is still the number one pathogen. And, uh, and then staph aureus after that, and then strep. And strep up, upwards of 10%. That's a scary bug. Enterococcus is really scary, much more scary than gram negatives. Um, like E. coli, serratia is pretty scary as well. Um, antibiotic sensitivities, this is very interesting. All the gram-positive isolates were sensitive to vancomycin, and that was the majority. 
The one thing is that not all the gram-negative isolates were sensitive to the septazidine or amikacin. And so the, sometimes you'll have resistance and the benefit, a lot of people say, well, what's the benefit of having a TAP specimen? I want to get the antibiotics in quickly is because sometimes you don't have sensitivity and it's nice to know what the bug is. It's rare, so you always err on the side of rapid treatment, but you would like to have pathology. And what the study concluded was the systemic antibiotics conferred no visual benefit, so we don't give them anymore, okay? That three port vitrectomy and vitreous tap biopsy were equivalent in eyes if the visual acuity was better than light perception. So we saved people a lot of surgeries and a lot of delay and a lot of late hours and staff time. And eyes with light perception vision at presentation fared better with a three port vitrectomy. And so the instance of obtaining 2040 acuity if you were light perception and had a vitrectomy was three times greater than if you had to tap and inject. Okay. The, the ability to achieve 2200 vision or better was almost twice as great, and the chances of having less than 2400 vision were uh, less than half as great. So in people with light percep perception vitrectomies, I mean, light perception vision on presentation, three-port vitrectomy was the, is the way to go. And we still apply that unless there's other difficulties. I remember one night, one weekend I was on call, and it was like, it was just, the on call from hell. We'd been there all day and we were operating at 2.30 in the morning. We'd been operating all day. And then I looked at the fellow and I said, I said, Brian, the only way we're going to stay here any later is if a light perception endophthalmitis comes in and about two minutes later, pring, they had an LP endophthalmitis down in the emergency room and we were there at about 5.30 in the morning. That was, that was brutal. Too old for that. <laughs> So again, in summary, the endophthalmitis uh, vitrectomy study is an older study, uh, and a lot of things have happened since then, and we'll kind of go over that a little bit. And its problems were that it only included cataract surgery and these other criteria that we mentioned above. And so there's limitations, because right away what it does, it eliminates other types of surgeries that get endophthalmitis. And we talked about a 2% incidence of endophthalmitis delayed in folks who have filtering procedures. Um, and we talked about people who have poor visualization, which can be some of more your se uh, severe endophthalmitis cases. So you don't know what to do. So there's all these unanswered questions. There's more surgical procedures at risk. The role of steroids, we don't know. There's a lot of new pharmacologic agents when the study was done. Fourth generation quinolones weren't around. And there's new advances in vitroretinal surgery. You know, we have wide angle viewing and things of that nature, keratoprosthesis. And then there's a lot more drug resistant organisms, especially in other world communities. So this study is really more applicable to the Western world. You know, if you go to India or parts of Africa, mm, the bugs are totally different, just as the causes of visual loss are. So the recommendations were also based on vision, and complication rates were not really involved. So there's a lot of issues with the study. So the case of, for vitrectomy, are fourfold. You could use strict endophthalmitis vitrectomy study criteria that we just went over, okay? Light perception vision after cataract surgery or secondary IOL presentation and or vitrectomy after the initial tap and a biopsy when they're not improving. So that's what the EVS study allowed you to do. But then there's alter alternative interpretations of the EVS data, which I'll go over. And then you can have surgery re uh, related to sequela of endophthalmitis, and there are multiple ones of those, non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage, wrinkling of the retina, retinal detachment, CME, and hypotony, which is very scary when you have hypotony. There's also the chronic endophthalmitis or the non-protocol endophthalmitis. So... Let's take a look in the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study. There were 44 eyes that had additional procedures within the first week after they're either their tap and inject or their vitrectomy surgery. That's about 10% of the folks in the study. And uh, in that group, of, of those people, um, um, uh, about 8% had had vitrectomy and about 13% had had tap and, bi and, tap and biopsy. And most of the cases were due to worsening of the inflammation despite the initial treatment. And remember, we had two eyes that weren't resistant, I mean, that were resistant to both of the antibiotics given. And these eyes had a much worse visual outcome. And this is like a total corneal melt with, with the lens implant, you know, kind of exploding through the cornea there like an alien. And um, so the people who had vitrectomy who needed additional procedures um, the people who had initial vitrectomies fared better. And so that's the case for vitrectomy. Um, there's alternate interpretations of EVS data. 
and Kuhn using Kentucky with his partner, they did 47 consecutive eyes, and they did total PV PPVs. They put keratoprosthesis on these people. If they had corneal clouding, they couldn't see. And 91% of those people achieved 2040 vision or better. Now, that was a non-randomized study. It was just a consecutive case series. And so if you have, you know, 47 eyes all with staph epi, you're going to do well no matter what, typically, especially if you get them early. But that was, that's interesting data. And then sequela of endophthalmitis. Anytime you have inflammatory reactions in the eye, usually it will clear, but sometimes it won't. She so can do that cystoid macular edema for persistent inflammatory reactions or from a severe inflammatory reaction. Wrinkling of the retina, very common. And then retinal detachments. Endophthalmitis can thin the retina. Typically, in a lot of cases at least, there's been a broken capsule or it's been a more difficult or traumatic surgery. And so you have all these interrelationships. And then hypotony. And this is a case of a funnel retinal detachment after endophthalmitis. You can still see the chordal thickening. And you get chordals with that as well. And this domino effect happens. And then what you'll see here pathologically is they get disinsertion of the ciliary body um, from that contraction. And then when you have that and the pressure goes down, hypotony is a really, really severe. When you see hypotony in the post-infection uh, situation or scenario, it's really, it's, it's a little bit of a scary thing because many times it means cyclic membranes are forming up where the ciliary body has been per permanently damaged. And then these eyes just crump. Okay. So chronic endophthalmitis or non-protocol endophthalmitis. Um, here's somebody who, who walked in. This, you can see the old scissors left, right surgery. This is an older case. And uh, when we put several sutures in, these guys did great. They took longer to heal. You had to cut sutures sometimes, but they did great. But this patient shows up seven months after the fact, has a hypopian, pretty white, quiet eye, not uncomfortable. They had been put on topical steroids for rebound inflammation by the operating surgeon over several months. And every time they reduced the steroids, the hypopian would come back. Then they started breaking through the steroids and uh, of course, the physician was nervous and sent them in. So typically, if you put steroids on an infection, what happens? The infection gets worse, right? Well, indolent endophthalmitis is the opposite of that. Many times you'll have little hypopians and things of that nature will initially respond very nicely if it's P. acnes, for example, and then it'll keep coming back. When you do that, you really want to make sure you get a good look at the capsule. And this is really more capsule opacification, but you'll get these numular areas of capsule opacification, these plaque-like things. And that is a telltale sign that this might be uh, P. acnes. And when these capsules are explanted and you look in the angles of the capsule, there's always a little bit of cortex. I know you do a great job, but there's always a little bit left in there. And what you'll see are these these organisms, and it's the P. acnes organisms. And so the therapy for those historically was uh, intravitreal injections worked for a little bit just like steroids, and then it came back. Then vitrectomy with opening the posterior capsule widely and injecting antibiotics into the capsule, into the vitreous cavity, and about 50% would respond to that. And then the others needed explantation of the lens and the entire capsule. If you think about it, most infections in the body, if you have a foreign piece of hardware in there, like in a joint or something of that nature, that has to come out. Why? Because the bacteria seeds into that. In endophthalmitis, we rarely take out the lens, and it's usually an in, in indolent type endophthalmitis where they get sequestered there, and the antibiotics will suppress them but not kill them all, and then they'll just come flaring up again. So many of these antibiotics that cause these indolent endophthalmitis, they, 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 uh, they, um, they grow very slowly. They have a lower uh, cycle. They have a slower cycle. I hate graphs, but the one thing I want you to, to, uh, to look here is at the bioavailability of oral fourth-generation quinolones, okay, and in terms of the vitreous cavity. And so most of the fourth-generation quinolones have been eliminated now because of systemic complications, whether diabetes or tendon ruptures in the elderly. But Avalox is still available 400 milligrams once a day. And that's a great adjuvant because it gets in the vitreous cavity in really high levels. Uh, it's about 25% of what's available in the plasma. And so you can kill or suppress indolent endophthalmitides that are sitting there. So it's a nice adjunct. GADI, Moxie, Grepifloxin, Trovifloxin, all these things are gone now except for Avalox. Why? Because of systemic complications. All right. 
Okay. Moxie is a little bit lower than other, but post-operative, post-traumatic, bleb-associated, and indolent endothymitis, consider using them, okay, in people who don't have a reaction. Avalox. Tequin now, gone, okay. So it's a 400 milligram tablet, and your mean serum concentration is 3.6 micrograms, um, and in the vitreous, it's 1.34 micrograms. So that's about 30, over 30 percent. That's really pretty good. In the aqueous, it's even higher. So that's really nice. And so that has excellent effect. And so some docs will even use Avalox in the perioperative period in cataract surgery. It's a little bit of an expensive way of doing things, but some have even been known to do that. And if you look at the breakdown, and you can just uh, substitute moxifloxacin here for GADI here, it just gets all kinds of organisms really nicely except for uh, enterococcus. And enterococcus is rare, but it's, it's a really tough one. And gram-negative organisms, too, works very, very, very well. So it has great coverage. The one Achilles heel is Pseudomonas. So in terms of corneal issues, you've got to be a little bit more concerned about that. And then piacnes, down here on the bottom left, it also gets piacnes. And this, again, is all using it orally. And that's great asset if you have somebody with indolent endophthalmitis or a bleb-associated inflammatory reaction that you're worried about becoming an endophthalmitis. You can put people on Avalox, and it makes, gives you a little sleep factor, I think. So the treatment, the, the indications for treatment of or use of fluoroquinolones, fourth generation ones, or at least treatment of blebitis, treatment of indolent endophthalmitis, and prophylaxis for traumatic endophthalmitis. So whether you give intravitreals or orals, I always put them on oral agents at least. And I sometimes will give them intravitreals at, time, at the time that the rupture globe occurs. Um, and then prophylaxis for post-cataract endophthalmitis. And it's an adjuvant treatment uh, potentially for acute endophthalmitis or prevention. All these things are in the literature. And then the one thing to take home from that is these oral medicines give you great intravitreal and uh, intracameral concentrations that kill most of the bugs that are susceptible. So uh, the other interesting thing about moxifloxacin, and you'll see Sam Muscat, you know, if you read the throwaways, he does this. He just, he takes the moxie and he puts the syringe right in the, in the, in the bottles that you get, that you give to your patients and injects it into the anterior chamber at the conclusion of the case. Why? Because there's no preservatives in it, okay? And so that's really gutsy, but he, that's, that's what he does. And he states he's never had an endophthalmitis since he started doing that, and he's done several thousand cases. Um, it's well tolerated. They've done ERGs. They're preserved, and they've done histopathologic sections in pigs and things of that nature, and there's no cellular reaction. Okay. And the half-life is 1.7 hours, so there's a rapid clearance, but the, the levels are very, very high. And what you want in an antibiotic is explained in this curve. There's three things you want. You want the maximum concentration. You want a good MIC for the bugs you're worried about. And then you want the area under the inhibitory curve, which is in the green, to be as large, as great as possible. So the one thing about MOXIE is that it gets cleared rapidly when you give it intracamerally, but you get this really high concentration that is way over the MIC needed, and it, it, uh, it has a great kill potential, okay? So that's the whole thinking behind what he does. All right. So just the things that you already know, okay? Here's the one bugaboo, and this is the one thing I want to go over. It has increasing resistance to MRSA and MRSA. So if you look at the Ocular Trust study, and MRSA and MRSA, MRSA in the general population, it keeps going up. So in the 1950s, 1 to 2% of people, uh, of, uh, 1 to 2% of staph infections were MRSA or MRSA, okay? In 2007, 50% of staph infections are MRSA or MRSA, okay, in the hospital situation. And the Ocular Trust study, which is tracking resistance in the United States today, and you can go online and look at this, they looked at 197 uh, uh, Staph aureus infections in uh, 2005 and 2006, and there were 33 MRSA infections. And that was about 
and only 15% were susceptible to fourth generation quinolones. So essentially, when you use Vigamox or Zymaxid and those types of things, you can almost assume that if you have a MRSA or MRSA infection, it's not killing it, okay? Maybe one out of six cases. It's resistant to fluoroquinolones, okay? They're resistant to fluoroquinolones. You just have to keep that in mind, all right? So it's a great drug, but there are cheaper drugs that do a better job against it, okay? And uh, Vince Duramo was a resident here, and they had six uh, eyes with MRSA MRSA that they gave uh, uh, that they treated with, and they just didn't do well, okay, NLP, hand motion. So they can be very, very tough to eradicate in the vitreous cavity as well, okay. Azithromycin, that's a newer antibiotic in the last three or four years, but if you look at the MIC levels here, it's, it's pretty terrible. So if you want to treat, you know, scruff or, you know, you know, what have you, lid problems, okay. But really, you've seen it disappear from the shelves pretty much because why? Well, it's not a very good post-operative drop, uh, drop, and I wouldn't recommend it. Why do they get resistance? Well, the bacteria are smart. They've been around in the primordial slime long before we showed up, billions of years, and so they have all these mechanisms against things that we can think for them. <clears throat> They'll enzymatically inactivate um, antibiotics. They'll modify. They'll actually modify the antibiotic target. They'll know how to do that. And then they'll set up alternate pathways that bypass the action of the antibiotic. And then a lot of them have what we call efflux pumps. So when you see staph uh, um, aureus, that is MRSA or MRSA, now they have these efflux pumps. So as soon as the bacteria gets inside, they recognize it and they shoot it back out. They just eject it so before it can have an effect. So there's all these different mechanisms that they have that they can get rid of things or, or um, inactivate antibiotics. So what are your options? Well, the options that you have are, are still pretty good, and the first two are common. We mentioned bacitracin, but it only comes in an ointment, and it's a little bit coil irritating, so that's a problem. But polytrim, trimethoprim, has been around forever, and it's still very, very effective against MRSA and MRSA, okay? Gram negatives, maybe not as much, but, uh, but most end off thimidides aren't related to gram negatives. So that's an excellent drug that's cheap, and it's been around forever. Vancomycin, you can make fortified <coughs> drops here, but it doesn't come in drop form. And the impenems, same thing. So in the post-EVS decade, there are new surgeries and modifications of procedures increasing endophthalmitis risk in non-cataract-related surgical patients. And we have new systemic pharmacologic agents with effective ocular penetration, even if orally. And we have new PPV approaches for people who have more significant disease and so our options have increased in a therapeutic, from a therapeutic standpoint. But all these things create ambiguity, but opportunities. So you have more choices, but it's tougher sometimes when you have more choices to make a choice. So there's no right or wrong. It's just a foundation. You take your data and you apply your clinical acumen to that particular patient, and then you move on. And so um, uh, does anybody know where, what happened at Runnymede? In England, in Egham. This is the U.S. Memorial there in England to it. Who remembers their English history? The Magna Carta. So that's where they signed the Magna Carta, right? The barons. It was King Edward, I think. And why is that important? Because that's a foundation document. This is one of the original remaining copies of the Magna Carta that were sent around to all the districts. And so between the Magna Carta and the, and the uh, Constitution was over 500 years. But you can take sections out of the Magna Carta that are directly placed in the Constitution of the United States. So there was 500 years of common English common law between then and now. So there was an evolution, in other words. People learned over time. And from the EVS and the things we do now, you're learning all the time and you're taking old data and putting on top of new data. But the old people, the old folks get credit. And so we have 27 constitutional amendments now. So you have a five-page document, which probably in history is probably the most perfect document ever written, quite frankly, in the modern era. I mean, in any era. But still, it needed 27 modifications in the little over 200 years it's been present. So you're always titrating your game. You're always honing your game. You're always reading, and you're always learning things. And it's like pirate's code. You know, they're guidelines, you know, they're just guidelines, they're not rules. So when you feel ambiguity and you feel not confident, it's because sometimes there's no clear-cut choices. 
Okay, there's just decisions to be made, and you have to live with them. And in end alpha minus, you're going to have times where it's going to make you feel badly. You're going to sit and look at those people and stare at the ceiling and worry about them, and you'll remember them because it's tough. They'll, they'll have to hold their hand, and you'll have to go through it because they can lose an eye. They can lose vision. But if you practice good pre-operative uh, judgment, if you have good uh, surgical technique, take your time, and then post-operatively do the same thing and listen to them if they have a problem and just don't push people off because you're tired or because it's late at night, you'll stay out of trouble and you'll do the best for them. And that's all you can do. Okay? Questions?